For today's lesson, we're going to talk more about tables. Let's start with a review from yesterday's lesson. We talked about what a table is. A table is something you use when you want to work with collections of values. You usually organize this, this collection of values using rows and columns. So what you need is a list where each element in the list is a list. In other words, you create a list of lists. For this particular example that we used for our program, we have two lists. Our main list, I mean, we, we have a, a list of lists, our table, for all of our different scores. And then we had just a complementary list to go with it so we knew the student for each section of scores. So we have our table and we have our list. In last lesson, we talked about creating and printing tables. We need to access every element when we create and print a table, and whenever we need to access every element, we use two for loops. The first for loop, or the outside loop, is usually for the row. And when we use our for loop, we do a range up to the number of rows we have. In this example, in our program, the number of rows we have is the number of students. The inside or nested loop is usually for the column. In our example, it was the number of scores. So you use two for loops to create a table, and you use two for loops to print a table. Every time you need to access every element in a loop, in a table, you will use two for loops. Now let's just kind of visually see what happens. Remember, the outside loop is the row, so it means I'm going to start at index zero, the first student, and everything, so the, um, the element that I'm accessing is going to stay in the first row. I'm going to start at the column, so I'm going to go to the inside loop, and I'm going to traverse the list. So I access every element. When the inside loop finishes, I increment, so I go to the second row. I start back at the beginning again, and I access every column in the second row. When this finishes, I increment the row. I start back at the beginning of the columns, and I access every element. When I reach the end, I increment the row and I access every column. So that's what's happening with our loops, the outside loop and the inside loop. So this is typically the way that we do it. But you can reverse the two, and that means you would just be going, starting with the first column, and going down the rows, and then increment, and go down the rows, increment, go down the rows, increment. So you can do it either way. This is just the typical way. We saw some code for creating the table and for printing a table. Let's look at option number one. This is the way that we did it in our video lecture, and I'm sure this is the way that you did it in your actual code. So once again, you have to have two loops. The outside loop is for our rows, and our inside loop was for our columns. Now I just used a generic max here, number of rows. So depending on your situation, this could be any number. In our example, it's the number of students. And for the columns, I use something general here just to help remind you what would go here is the maximum number of columns. In our example, it was the number of scores. We needed to have some kind of a temporary list. I just called it temp, and it's the square brackets. And then I got a random number, and I appended it. So the inside loop just appends all of the columns into a list. And then once the inside loop finishes, I append this list into my list of lists. And then I increment to go to the next row. Repeat the process. For printing, it was similar. I can still use two rows, I mean two for loops, R for my rows and C for my columns. I don't have to do any kind of little trickery. I just have my two for loops. And I'm accessing each element by using the square brackets. When we have a single list, I had a single set of square brackets, and now I have a table, so I have two sets. And the first one is always going to be the row, and the second one is always going to be the column. So even if I switch my for loops and I have columns and rows, I still always have my first index as my row, my second index as the column. So once you get used to accessing your elements like this, just stay consistent and never change it. Now we also learned a shortcut way that doesn't work every time, but it's a special case. And something like printing, when I don't really care 
to um, about the index. I don't need to access it in any way. And I just want the element. I can use my shortcut way like we did with our other with a list of item in my table and then thing in item. So still two for loops. I just don't have to worry about the actual um, index. And then I would print the thing. Now if this option too does not make sense to you, if it seems a little bit of confusing, then just don't even worry about it. You never have to use it. Option one will always work. But if this does make sense to you and you can understand when you can use it, then this is a handy tool because it will save you time. Now well, you're going to have some reading from the textbook today and it's going to show you another way to create a table. Their way only uses one for loop, but it's actually kind of using a shortcut for the second for loop. So you still have to have two, but this isn't a for loop. They're using the replicator operator instead. And they're not create, starting with an empty list. They are actually creating a list, a table filled with zeros. So you can kind of take a look and see what's happening. They are creating a, a list of zeros and then appending it to a list. So I'm creating a list of lists this way. But just realize that they're all zeros and if I wanted to change them to fill them with actual numbers, I would have to use an assignment statement in something like this to do it. So it would be a little bit different, but take a look at this because it's certainly a valid and useful way of creating a table. Now the next thing in the program was to get totals and actually to end up with an average. In order to get a total of the entire table, I need to access every element. And every time I need to access every element, I use two for loops. Usually the first for loop is for the row and the second for loop is for the column. So I'm going to access it starting with the first element and going this way, incrementing this way, this way, and this way. And once I access every element, I'm just going to accumulate it in a total. So once again, there's two ways I can do this, the way with two for loops. Anytime I have a total, I must initialize it. So don't forget this important step. If you don't initialize your total and you try to accumulate it, you will get an error. So my, I'm going to have my outside for loop with my R for row, and my max will be the number of rows. In our example, the number of rows is the number of students. And my inside loop, C for column, so I'm going to go traverse the columns, and I'm going to access each element. Remember, this is the code for accessing each element. Two square brackets, always the R and the C, and I'm going to accumulate it. Option two, this is one of those special cases where I don't really care about the index, so I can use my shortcut if I want, item in my table and thing in item, and just accumulate. If this makes sense to you, this is a great way of doing it. And if it doesn't, just ignore it and always stick with the one way that you know will work. Now, your problem is not to find the total, but to find the average. So how do you find an average? It's always the total divided by the number of elements. And how do I know how many elements I have in my table? Well, if I know the rows and I know the columns, I can multiply them together. It's typical math. I multiply my columns times my rows, and I will get the number of elements. So if you use this information, you can take your total and actually use it to get the average. That's going to be up to you. Uh, you will be able to figure that out on your own. The next function I would like for you to add to your uh, program is to get the averages of each row. So we've got the averages of the whole thing, but now I want to know just for Anne herself, what is her test average? For Bob, what is his test average? For Carl, for each student, I want to know what their individual average is. Now, I could do this several different ways. One thing I could do is just find the average and print it, find the average and print it, and if I never need it again, that would be perfectly fine. But I might do something with it. So I could have just a whole bunch of variables. We know that's not very efficient, so instead we're going to create another list. So just like we have a list that accompanies this table, for the student, I can have another list that's going to be the averages for each row. In order to create, uh, to get my row totals, I'm going to take a part of this code and part of this code and kind of mush them together. So I'm going to do my own mashup. This is how I got the totals and this is how I created the list. I need to do a combination. 
I'm still going to need to in initialize a total and use it. And I'm going to need to some kind of a list, but I'm going to rearrange things. I'm actually going to create a list for my row averages. So I'm going to put that on top, and then inside I'm going to have to go row by row. So after each row is finished, I need to reinitialize a total and get that that I'm going to append to my list. So I'm going to take this code and this code and basically switch them. And then instead of appending here, I'm going to be accumulating my total. So the code will look something like this. I'm going to initialize my row total as an empty list. I'm going to have my two loops. My outside loop will be my for the rows. And it's going to go up to the maximum number of rows. Remember for ours, that would be number of students. I'm going to initialize my total. And I'm going to start my inside loop. I'm going to go across the columns because I want to go this way and then find the total. So you're going to access that element no matter what we do inside, accessing that single element always looks like this. Two square brackets, row, column. I'm accumulating my total. Once I've traversed the entire list here, I'm done with my total. I can append it to this list. Then I'm going to increment my row. I'm going to come down here, start at the beginning of my columns again, add everything up by accumulating my total, and then append. Then I increment again, go all the way across. I'll do that for every student. Now remember, your task is not to find the total, but to find the average. So what will you need to add to this code in order to take that total and change it to an average? So think about what you need to add and where in this code are you going to add it. That's going to be your task. I will not give you the code. Once you get that one working, your next function is to get column totals. So we've got row totals. Now you're going to do similar code to get column totals. So now I want to know what's the average of everybody who took test one, what's the average? What's the average for test two? The average for test three? So I want to get all kinds of information on my table. Here's the code for finding the rows. And finding the, co the column is not much different. It's just how we traverse that's different. When I start, when my outside loop is row and I inside loop is column, I go in this direction. Now I want to start here and I want to go down. So the first column and then traverse the rows, increment to the second column, traverse the rows. So what's going to be different here? Okay, I want you to think about that. And you're going to decide what do you need to change besides the name here. So I'll make it my call to column total. And then what else changes do you need to make so that I'm traversing my elements the other way instead of this way? You'll be able to figure that out and make that into a function. But instead of total, I want average. So to finish your tables program, you already have three functions from the last lecture. You have your main, your fill table, and your print table. You might have started getting the average. If so, that's great because that is a requirement. This is what you need to add to your program. You need to add a function that gets an average of all the test scores. You need to add a function that gets the averages of just the rows, and add a function that gets the averages of just the columns. So average for each student, average for each test. And you need to add a function that's going to print these results. So in the end, when you run your program, it might look something like this. Here's what you've already got done. And here's what you're going to add. So my function that adds that gets the average of every element, the function that gets the average of the rows, and the function that gets the average of the columns. And then the function that prints all of this. You don't have to change anything that you have, you're just adding to it. Now if you have time, if you've got that one finished and it wasn't too hard for you, then here is an extra challenge. I would like for you to modify your print table so the function that you created yesterday, modify it so that you add in the averages as you print. So this is what I'm talking about. Here's the table that you already did, and then go to the same function and add in another column that's going to print the average. So if you're really understanding what's going on in the print, you'll be able to do this without a lot of problems. Now it's not required, so you can turn in your program without doing it, but if you have time, I encourage you to figure it out. So the more you figure it out, the more comfortable you will be working with tables.
Once you have everything working, you have seven functions and they all do what they're supposed to do, you are ready to submit it for a grade. You can use the program turn in link.